Hello, I'm Matthew Bransgrove. This is Broker Alerts. Today we've got a special treat. We've got a live one. This is Joshua De Batista, a former broker with Plan. Plan. And now he's no longer a broker with anyone. Correct. Okay, so you've been expelled from the industry. Uh, argumentatively speaking, yes. Okay, so what I'd like to do today is to talk about what happened, how it happened, and what you did wrong or didn't do wrong uh, to be expelled from the Australian uh, consumer mortgage broker industry. Uh, I say consumer mortgage broker industry because you're still in with a chance in the commercial broker industry, is that right? Correct, to anything that's not NCCP. Okay, and any lenders who aren't NAB, is that is that right? Uh, well, no, at this present time, no lenders will take me on. None of the bank lenders will take you on? No, correct, yeah. Right. yeah. What about Latrobe? Uh, unsure. Unsure. There are some lenders that have direct accreditation processes, but um, it's a matter of still making sure you've got your MFAA memberships, uh, your dispute resolution in place, which I now have to sort of organise all that myself and no longer, which I used to do through my aggregator. Right, right. Um, well, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> so, um, Josh, you left school. I did. When yes. was that? <laughs> um, oh, I couldn't tell you the date. It was about midway through year 11. Mid um, <laughs> midway through year 11. <laughs> yeah. I, and mid you went off and... Uh, Got a job? I did. Well, actually, I opened my own um, sports card shop. Um, right. I was very entrepreneurial. Uh, basketball yes. cards, NBA basketball cards were very popular at the time. Okay. And I went and opened my own sports card shop. All right. Moving forward through time, then? Uh, worked through retail for quite a few years. Uh, right. Worked my way up to a retail manager of a retail chain. Um, right. What and, was the chain? Uh, it was Video Games Heaven. Right. So working in uh, with video games, playstations. When Sounds like heaven if you're a video <laughs> games man. <laughs> if you're into video games and computers, it was sure. definitely a, a fun job. Then, um, then what did you do? Uh, moved, got a bit older and moved into the bit more corporate selling world and I started working at CGU Insurance, uh, selling insurance products. Okay, and that's when you first came across the mortgage industry? Correct, that's right. CGU uh, underwrit uh, a variety of um, lenders for their insurance products. So right. I worked in the financial services queue a little bit, um, predominantly working with Aussie Home Loans clients doing selling them insurance products. Okay, and then what happened? Um, CGU wanted to put me through an underwriting degree and uh, sort of get me locked in and committed to working for them for quite a few years. I so just, your soul sort it, of thing? Kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sort of this is the career for you, we like you, we want you to stay and, you know, work And what work was your retention way. period? How long did you have to... I, look, it's been a few years now, but I think it was about five or seven years. Right, um, right. Otherwise I had to... It's longer than most marriages. Yeah, correct, <laughs> yes. I could leave at any time, but I would have had to have paid back um, right. all the schooling that they were prepared okay. to put me through. And then what happened? Yep. So from there I decided to take a step out of the uh, corporate sales type lifestyle and I went and worked with uh, disadvantaged children and uh, street kids. Oh um, really? What, what got you into that? Uh, my m mother had worked in that industry all her working life basically. She had worked with um, under uh, uh, child protection, working with kids that had been abused and also We've done a lot of fostering. I've got a quite a few foster siblings, siblings in, in my life, yeah, growing up. Um, and uh, it's a very female-dominated industry. So when a male comes along um, and says that they'd be interested in working in it, they kind of, you know, <laughs> grab on with two hands and pull you in. Um, right. So, and I did that for nearly four years. Uh, right. I met my lovely wife uh, a, well, while I was working in one of the jobs there. Okay. Um, and then you got back into the corporate world. Yeah, look, I, it's a very burnout industry. Most people generally only last two to three years in that industry, obviously mm -hmm. for what you're dealing with and, um, you know, with the kids and everything. Um, and my sister's, uh, one of her best friends, was a mortgage broker, ex-banker, had been a mortgage broker for, for a while, and in two, this was 2004, I started mortgage broking. I decided to uh, move over and uh, to Australian Mortgage Brokers, and I joined Australian Mortgage Brokers as a broker under a franchise model, and, okay. ha and had a sub-franchise. Okay, and you were working with a real estate agent, I think. Correct, that's right. At the time, Australian Mortgage Brokers had a corporate relationship with Stockdown Lego, and we ran Stockdown Lego Financial Services. Okay, so when they sold a property, you would, you'd sell them finance? Do the home loans, correct, that's exactly right. And I had a okay. variety of real estate agent offices that Who I looked Who did you up aggregate uh, through back uh, then? Australian Mortgage Brokers were their own aggregator back okay. then. Um, this is all pre-NCCP uh, okay. and GFC, so it was very different back then, uh, so mortgage broking. All right, and what happened next? Well, 
uh, we had the GFC. I did that for quite a while, uh, and that's where I started my um, my uh, I guess broken career. Um, did that for quite a while and uh, built up um, just predominantly residential. Didn't do any commercial uh, at all at that stage. Uh, we had the GFC. Uh, yeah. Industry took a big hit. Uh, commissions were dropped. Um, uh, they, it was an introduction not long after that of the NCCP Act, which I actually think was a, a good thing to happen. I think anything yep. that puts us in a more professional position, uh, more education, and, you know, better for the consumer is better in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had to diversify and work through my business, so I started getting into commercial. Um, right, so after the GFC, yep. uh, you continued as a residential broker, but because uh, I think you said that commissions had dropped from about 0.08 to Point oh five. Correct. Yep. You were now wanting to diversify, so you started to do commercial uh, loans Co- as well. Correct. Get into some commercial lending. Um, I was uh, uh, my region with my uh, franchise was Gippsland, so I was down where there was a lot of farming. So I got into so farming. Regional. Yeah, regional. Uh, Victoria, uh, southeast Victoria, and um, got got into doing a lot of farming finance, specifically broiler farms or chicken farms, as they're more commonly known. Um, I've got a bit of a nickname. So you did the finance for chicken farms? Correct. That's exactly okay, right. That's yeah. quite a niche. Yeah, it, it is. And I'm quite well known as the chicken farm guy to writing right. BDMs and uh, people in the industry that's known me for a while will know oh, you've, you've right. done chicken Who would farm. you write loans like that with? Uh, most of the four majors. Um, I did a few with NAB. I did a few with CBA. Um, I did a couple with ANZ. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. But so it, what's the biggest commercial? loan you've written? Uh, well, it wasn't a broiler farm. I moved over to um, more expanding my commercial career, moved into all various adverse and different types of commercial businesses and lending. Uh, I eventually got into development finance, predominantly residential development finance, building apartment buildings, um, and did a couple of big uh, development loans. I, the biggest one that I've done with the bank was with CBA, mm-hmm. uh, and that was 13 and a half mil, roughly, uh, give right. or take a couple of bucks. When was that? Um, that would have been around 2013, 14, I think. Right. Um, and all along you were also servicing your residential uh, clients? Correct. That's exactly right. I built up a reasonable sized database. Um, up until when I finished being a mortgage broker with plan, I didn't do a lot of uh, advertising. It was basically existing database, just maintaining my existing database and then referring from existing database. So I'd get people ring me up and say, oh, you did a loan for my friend or my okay. so brother or... That was that brings us up pretty much to this year. Yep. Okay. And at the beginning of this year, your world was turned upside down. Ah, uh, yeah, correct. I. Uh, and 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 you'd been a broker for sixteen years. Fifteen. Fifteen. Fifteen years, pretty much. So. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, I'd been a broker. I think close to ten or eleven years with Plan. Um, right. So a decade uh, with these people. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Yep. Uh, I, I. So you uh, think after a decade, they'd give you a lot of care and consideration and uh, courtesy? Uh, well, that's that's how I felt. Yes. And I, due process. Yeah. Well, I definitely felt like that. Um, you wanted the family when you'd been there that long. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's see just exactly what they do to their mm-hmm. family. Why don't you tell us how it all began? Uh, well, I was at a PD day at the start of this year, and my relationship manager. Um, I mean, her had a bit of a chat and uh, she brought to my attention that I had some files flagged. Um, There is a newer system that had sort of come out from the lenders. I wasn't aware how long it had been in place, but all she said to me, all applications that get submitted into uh, lenders by brokers um, obviously go through a variety of checks to check the um, quality of the uh, data that's been submitted. Uh, yeah, I, look, think, I think um, NextGen.net and Equifax, between them, have all sorts of algorithms that they, they throw at it. Yep, and um, uh, applications basically get put into three categories, and they call it the traffic light system. You've basically got green, amber, and red. Uh, green is obviously that an application that passes all the preliminary checks uh, goes through fine. It deems to be no issues whatsoever. Yep. Uh, yellow, uh, I believe, is considered to be um, inconsistencies or things that might not quite add up, um, uh, mild discrepancies in the application uh, versus the supporting Things that dots. have to have a closer look Correct. at. Correct, yeah, things where, where, where they'd probably look at and uh, generally um, from explanation can probably be sorted out. Uh, and red is was explained to me is basically um, you're looking at a fraudulent application, so proven fraud or, mm. or high sus- sus- suspicious of fraud on the application. Right. Um, I had five files uh, that got reviewed um, and... As ambers or as reds? Uh, or? Four as ambers and one as red um, was red. what I was told. Um, and that I would be contacted in due process by uh, Blesser, which is Plans uh, Licensing 
licensing. Um, right. And so um, that's the one that um, does the licenses for Plan Choice and Fast. Correct. For, I think for that's Navigator. The yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Correct. That's exactly right. I think you said, and I think I've seen everybody's got a, an email address with. Uh, advantage. Advantage, yeah. Advantage yeah. Financial Services, um, I believe, is is predominantly owned by NAB or majority shareholding, and mm. Advantage I, it also uh, is heavily connected with Plan and Plan Lend. Um, okay. They all pretty much own NAB, uh, Advantage Financial Services. All right. So, so what happened next? You've got they've, they've said that there are five files. Uh, five five files uh, needed to be reviewed. I, I um, wasn't terribly stressed or worried. I've been a broker for sixteen years. I don't really have a plan on doing anything else at this stage. It's mm -hmm. sort of become my career. I really enjoy helping people and helping my clients uh, to achieve their financial goals. You're lucky. Goals. You're very lucky, um, Joshua, from a lot of people who come to me because there seems to be, um, uh, you've, you've also got a stream of income coming from your commercial uh, broking arm, which is also done through private uh, so the if what I call the cartel, yeah. the aggregated cartel can't catch, can't touch you there. Well, yeah, not non-coded lending doesn't require aggregation or NCCP or licensing. So um, yeah. at, at this stage, it's like another stream. A lot of people who who were expelled from the industry through what I call the Hollywood blacklist or the shadow discipline system, but it, I think it's more than that. Um, they don't have any income other than residential loan yep. income, yep. and so they can't even pay a lawyer. Uh, Ten cents to fight because they're too busy wondering where the next meal's mm. going to come yep. from. I mean, so they the literally have to go off and start driving an Uber yep. uh, the next day. Uh, it's that bad. Yep. But you're not in that position. Yeah, no. Well, I was definitely told in my process that where one door closes, another one opens, and I'm sure I'll land on my feet. Oh, they said that, did they? They did in a verbal conversation, right. yeah. Um, well, I'm not happy with that, Josh. That's uh, ne I'm, neither was I. I'm <laughs> outraged with that because I don't want this door to close f for you unless they prove that you did something wrong. Correct. Something yeah. that the other 16,000 brokers wouldn't have done. In other words, something unprofessional. Yep. Okay. So, and 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 it has to be something that warrants being expelled from the industry. You uh. know? So, y y you know, I remember there was a, there was once a video taken of George W. Bush picking his nose at a stadium. Yep. Now, I don't think that would warrant impeachment. There are a lot of other things that might have warranted <laughs> impeachment. But not picking his nose. Yeah. And I think it's the same with a broker. I mean, a broker may uh, overlook a particular check uh, inadvertently. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't, and especially if there's no consequences, but more than that, no moral turpitude. There was no intention to do anything wrong. It yep. was just carelessness because, uh, I don't know, their, 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 their daughter was up crying in the middle of the night the night before. That is not something you get struck off for. And I say that as a solicitor because. Solicitors have a disciplinary procedure, and um, you know, you, you the, the the process itself is a punishment. Yep. I've worked out. You know, so someone makes a complaint against you, you have to answer letters. They go backwards and forwards, and they figure you won't get into that sort of uh, trouble again because you had to go through that nightmare process of sending letters backwards and forwards. Yep, correct. Yep. If you do something like uh, I don't know, you're rude and, and and obnoxious, they might even censure you. Yeah. You know, if you do something um, culpably careless, you know, reckless, not yeah. just negligent, because lots of solicitors get sued for negligence every year and the files aren't reported to the Law Society for disciplinary action. It's just you were negligent. You yeah. dropped the ball. Um, and then it, it moves all the way up to where uh, a solicitor, if a solicitor tries to mislead a client, mislead another solicitor, mislead the court, you get struck off, yep. and rightly so, because that goes to the fundamental heart of trust in the profession. And it's the same for brokers. If a broker tries to mislead a lender, yep. right, that's one thing. And I think, yeah, strike them off. Mm. But we've got to get there. And that's not what, what what's happened. You have not received any due process. You haven't even, as I understand it, received any written allegation. Uh, I found the process, yeah, quite, quite daunting, as I said. So Blessed did contact me. Um, and uh, not long after th the, this was about February, March, I sat down with my Blessed representatives um, in a what I consider, I guess, a casual environment. We sat down in a, in a small office and the files were reviewed uh, in question. Radio. Let's punch through them quite quickly. Yep. Um, I, I don't want to dwell on the ones which you think they rubber stamped and said okay to. Yep. 
All right. Uh, well, pr predominantly it was around, uh, the meeting was go governed around um, getting my side of the story, the information that was supplied, why it was supplied that way, yep. um, you know, double checking some of the information. One of the applications allegedly had uh, fake pay slips on it. Uh, right. what, one of the applications. Well, let's dwell on that one. Yep. Because when you hear fake pay slips, everyone's aghast. Yep. Okay. So let's drill down into that a little bit and uh, let's hear your explanation as to why you think uh, that may not have been the case. Uh, well, at, at the time, this file is nearly two years old. So at the time, we didn't collect uh, bank statements for verification. Uh, it wasn't right. required at the time. So I didn't have bank statements on that particular file to verify uh, income uh, right. or, or, or wages going into the client's account. Um, I just collected the required information at the time, which was and two not pay slips. banks. I no, mean, no, correct. It wasn't a requirement it's the from bank's the bank. Requirement was not. Yeah, it was, was not. That's right. It was no requirement from the bank or my aggregator or processors right. at that time. This is a common theme. I've noticed that um, during that changeover period, where the banks went from low scrutiny to high scrutiny. Yeah. Uh, the wisdom of hindsight's being applied, and brokers are sort of being. Uh, persecuted based on the standard now. Correct. Then what was when required back, back there? Then. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it reoccurs, but go on. Um, so yeah, that particular client um, was well known to me. Um, at the time, I'd done loans for um, her family. Um, I wasn't uh, suspicious of the client in any way and had no reason to think uh, anything other than what the information provided was correct. Was this the, the, the one that worked for a mother or something? Uh, no, no, that was another file. So right. uh, this was just a client that had a job. Um, I've since contacted the client uh, right. after all of this process. Um, the client has assured me that they definitely did work there um, right. and that uh, they worked for a very small business. Uh, they didn't get pay slips on a regular basis. And uh, when they uh, uh, went for the line application with me and I said, oh, look, I need a couple of pay slips to prove your income, they uh, contacted their employer and they said that I need a couple of pay slips for my uh, line application that I'm going for. The employer happily obliged mm. and you know made up a couple of pay well, slips. I've, I've come across that uh, a, a number of times and I think there's a cynicism and, and a sarcasm about that. Um, but small businesses don't necessarily give, uh, they're meant to. So a big corporate is going to punch out the pay slips to Correct. everyone yeah. as and when they're supposed to. But yeah. small businesses often don't. Yeah. I mean, they, they often don't know that they're obliged to or that they have to. Yeah. They hand it all to their accountant at the end of the year who does the group certificates. Yeah. But they don't necessarily have pay slips uh, uh, as they go along. Yeah. And the fact that they then create a pay slip for you yes. so that you can jump through that hoop, yes. otherwise they wouldn't be able to get a loan, is not necessarily evidence of criminality. No, well, at the time it wasn't considered an issue. The loan application was approved and settled and only two years later w w was the question of the pay slips brought into. So in my opinion, they weren't fraudulent enough to be picked up at the application. They didn't. They were computer generated. They had the company details on there. I verified the company. It existed. Um, uh, so this they is all, something They all added up correctly. E Equifax's algorithm has, has picked up. No, I don't believe they did. I think it went through with flying colours. And I think afterwards, that particular client's line application went into arrears. Right. Um, and that triggered an investigation. I for, see. For, for, I think, and look, I don't know. I'm speaking out of tune because I don't actually know how um, uh, their processes uh, are behind the scenes, but obviously a, a higher level of investigation. Right, on, so on the, the bank was duped and you were duped, if, if indeed that is the case. Yeah. Um, and let's put it at its highest. Let's assume that they were fake bank slips. This, this woman had gone and um, uh, created those, those on a word processor and, yep. and, and uh, given them to you. Um, there was no way you could tell that, and yeah, there was correct. no way. Uh, and no, the no way to believe believe otherwise sort yeah. of thing, yeah. Because I think before people, before the bank required you to s collect the bank statements, um, asking for those uh, pay slips was essentially almost self-certification. Uh, yeah, correct, yeah. Yeah, and indeed, right up until the bank started sharing information with each other so that um, uh, if, if you're going for a loan with NAB, they could pull up uh, the, the database and have a look at someone's real statement with ANZ. Yeah. Uh, until that point in time, everything was was um, self-certified. In other words, it was it was like you're given something. Yeah. 
and what are you going to do? How do you prove that it's wrong? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially if there's no suspicion to, to, to believe there's so. No I've had plenty of loan applications or customers come to me where I've had a gut feeling or a suspicion and, right. and not proceeded with them. Okay. Hmm. Next loan. Uh, another one. This and one. What did they, by the way, what did they say about that? They led you to believe that you had nothing to answer for on that? or uh, It's a bit grey. Again, the, the whole process is very daunting. Um, when I had my uh, lender review, so I actually yeah. had a meeting with the lender, um, again, they don't tell you uh, right. specifically what, what... So it's not grey, it's opaque. You can't actually see what's going on. No. You'd, you'd, you're, not, you're given the accusation, at which the, I suppose at, is at, something. At the point of, of information. No. Well, you, you're given the suspicion. You're not given a, an allegation. You're given the suspicious circumstance. Yeah. And you're not told what they make of it. Well, when you're sitting in a meeting and somebody says to you, this application has fake placelips on it, what have you got to say for yourself? I mm. go, well... It's a two-year-old application that I submitted, approved, settled, and has gone through fine. I'm, I'm not sure why. You're, this is the first I've heard of it. I'm not aware that they're fake pay slips. Okay, so let's go on to your the next of the five loans. Uh, the next one was another client of mine that I'd known quite well, um, and he uh, worked for a company that his mother was a sole director shareholder of. I submitted that like, he's POYG employed, in no way is he self-employed. He receives pay slips, he receives uh, a wage, his wage goes into his bank account. I collected bank statements to verify that his wage went into his bank account. So this was when you did have to... Uh, it was statements. kind of on the cusp of it coming in and being the nature of the application and the fact that he worked for a family member, I thought it was better to go above and beyond the required information. Okay. I'm not 100% certain whether it was actually required at the time, yep. but at that point in time... But you did. Yeah, correct. At that point in time, I think most aggregators were starting to advise brokers to start collecting more information around income right. uh, verification than just the standard two pay slips, which was pretty standard in the industry prior to. Um, uh, I collected bank statements to show his income, but not only that, if you wanted to take a step back, I knew the family well. I'd done loans for his mum and dad. I'd done loans for the business that he worked for. So you knew, knew the business I, existed? I, I knew the business existed. I'd sit down with this client in his office in the and business's premises. you knew what the premises. business's turnover was? Correct. I knew the business employed him. I knew how he was employed because uh, I'd done lending for the business. I'd seen the business tax returns and know that he was right. 100%. So how did that the other one you said went into arrears. How did this one get on their radar? Uh, I'm not sure. I wasn't informed and I, and I don't. But it didn't go into default? No, I don't believe the loan has ever been in default, this particular client. Uh, right. There may have been the odd... So they loan. said that you, sh that you should have made him self-employed? Well, they said that uh, based on the information that I knew of where he was, they would probably have looked at it more as a self-employed client and may require more information for income verification like full tax returns. Okay, so uh, they had problems with, uh, th 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 they felt that this should have been written up as a self-employed uh, well, the, they said that they probably would have gathered more information uh, in relation to uh, the application. They probably would have requested... Uh, and when you say return. they, are we talking about the aggregated plan or are you talking about the lender? I'm talking about the my uh, blesser representative in the time of my review of the file said that un under those circumstances, they probably would, the lender probably would have requested more information in terms of the... Um, and is this is this written? Is there a rule? I mean, uh, is it a is it? Is it that sounds very to me. Yeah. I'm a lawyer, and and we've got all sorts. I've got a thing called the solicitors' yeah. um, rules, which I've got to know. I've I've got the Legal Profession Act. I've got to know inside out, and I know exactly where I stand. Yeah, uh, that sounds very wishy washy to me. They probably would have. Yeah. Uh, is when you're accredited, was there a course? Did 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 NAB was this was the lender? Well, NAB? it's it comes down to the verification of the client's employment status. Uh, in my opinion, and I guess legally, the client is not self-employed. They are, in, are an employee. They are a PAYG employee. They are employed by a company. But that's what I'm saying. So they're saying that they think that um, you ought to have done something else. Yeah, correct. So I followed the rules and regulations of a PAYG client, supplied all the information required for a PAYG client. Yep. How many other people did they employ? Uh, I think it varies, but I've seen them employ up to sort of 15 to 20 people. So it's a reasonably re substantial re Reasonably sized company. company. It's not like yep. it's a mum and dad type operation. No, if it were a mum and dad operation... I would definitely have, have uh, probably got... there were got, three of them, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, correct. I would have definitely gotten more information, but I felt like that the size of the company and the information that I knew, there was no... 
worked out in my mind how he was employed. Um, the, you know, there was no servicing issues. There was no deductions in his tax return. There was nothing that would make the lender change their mind. Right. Had had I been more, uh, had I given them information and said, look, he works for his mum uh, or yeah. a company that his mum's a director yeah. of, and they requested tax returns. So they're, they're, okay, all right. So it wouldn't have stopped the loan application. And, and what that that was their conclusion that they would have. Uh, well, it was the other issue was that his pay slips had uh, an annual amount that didn't add up to his wage. Um, I asked the client at the time of the application why you've got an annual amount that's higher than your wage gets paid into your account and, and on the payslip. And that said because he's on a salary package that includes a car, phone and some other perks and the annual amount uh, takes into consideration those perks. All right. So that's two of the uh, of, of the problem files. Uh, what's number three? Uh, the next one was a client um, that uh, it was alleged that she may still be with her um, uh, ex-husband. So I did a loan application for this client back in, I think it was around 2014, and at the time her and her husband was separating. Uh, they owned a property together. They separated and she, I did a loan for her and she was buying a property on her own. Right. In that application, uh, and at that time I did meet the husband. Um, he was at the first appointment I had with the client because they still owned a property together and he wasn't sure whether things needed to be signed and things like that. Um, that was fine. That, did uh, they sell that property or? They did, kept... yes. No, they sold the property and um, she went and bought another property. She was my client. I did a loan for her. She came back did to- did you do a loan for him? No, 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 never did any loan. Right. So, him. husband and wife getting divorced. Yep. They're going to sell their property. Yep. So they sell that property. Correct. It was already which sold. Which is what yeah. you'd expect. Yep. And they split it up. Yep. And she used her half of the proceeds. Yep. To buy the other property. Correct. Yeah. To buy a okay. loan, and I did a loan for her for that property. And presumably, he went off and bought himself a did house. He, did his own thing. Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, don't know. Not a client of mine. Um, didn't meet him after that meeting. Okay. Um, a couple of years later, she contacts me and says, I'd like to upgrade uh, houses or change properties. Um, I right. want to sell this one and buy a new one. And I said, that's fine. Went and saw the client, had a bit of chat to her. She lives with her uh, elderly mother. Um, an elderly mother helps contribute a little bit to her cost of living and things like that. But none right. of that was part of the issue of the application. Um, she uh, proceeded to go through, buy a new property, sold her own property, and we upgraded and moved her over to a new property. Right. Um, uh, at the time of the application, I was collecting bank statements um, as per requirement at that time. Uh, and I noted on the noticed on the bank statements that she had a car loan that she hadn't disclosed to me. There was repayments. Rang right. up, spoke to her about it. This is prior to the application being submitted. Yep. Uh, had a conversation with her about it. She apologised and said she forgot about the car loan. Um, it's an automatic payment, so she doesn't think much about it. We yep. added it into servicing, and I submitted the deal with the car loan there. Right. On my uh, review of the file with uh, Blesser and the lender um, uh, later on, they said to me that uh, she had an undisclosed credit card, um, which we went through the bank statements, and there was no payments to any credit cards or... So in the review, yep. you went through all the bank statements that you... That I collected at the time of the application. None of them had any payments. None, none of them had any card. payments or reference to the credit card. So your failure was a fla failure of clairvoyancy. You basically weren't able to... Yeah, well, there's no way to know. It. That's right, correct. Uh, you mm. know, there, there was absolutely no way to know whether she had a credit card or not. Because um, you're not Equifax. Well, no, that's correct. That's exactly right. Mm. Um, and... Um, they also told me that this particular client, so the loan was with Plan Lend, this particular client banks with NAB, um, and um, her ex-husband banks with NAB, and apparently uh, after they that she brought the new property, he changed his address to the new property's address. Right. Uh, and therefore, we're asking me things like, oh, was he, you know, was he around? Did you see him? Was he in a meeting? And I was like, no, nope, no, no evidence of him being there. Never disclosed that he was there. So it's, what is it, criminal or something? For, well, I don't understand. I, what, I, what's I could, the significance I could of the husband giving the address? Correct. I could list a hundred reasons why um, he could uh, have listed that down. Uh, I spoke to my cousin yesterday. She's divorced. And she said every weekend they do something as a family yep. with the kids. So, uh, yep. So, why I wouldn't she leave you? Why wouldn't? First of all, what, what, 
So they were impl- I guess they were implying that that potentially she was still coupled or still still in a relationship with him. Right. And uh, therefore, she can borrow less, can she? Well, or? it would come down to wanting to know the more circumstances of Rand, whether he's working, not working, what's their financial position, if he's involved in her life, if he isn't involved in her life. Um, it could cha- it could potentially change the process of location. But again, this was information that was new to me only at the time yeah. of, of my review. And at just the time as an of aside, location, I think this is all getting too out of control. Uh, it, it's, it seems to be think responsible lending. They're out doing themselves to go to the next step, and the next step they'll be um, doing DNA swabs. Well, next. correct. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Like you know, the, as I said, there's a n- number of reasons I could name why mm. he potentially changed his postal address. He might not have a stable employment. He might not have stable uh, living arrangements. Uh, he might not have. Yep. He might just like to have his mail go there because he catches up with her once a week. You know, right. if they okay. were married together, they've obviously got history and a life. All right. So, did they did they tell you you were culpable on that, or they were going to give uh, you a pass? Th- nothing on that? was ever particularly clear, clearly li- listed out as to w- right. what was reviewed um, versus what the major issues were. It was across the board. I was kind of told by my BDM at the end of it that it was a, a, a number of little things that made them lead to the conclusion of terminating me, rather than one specific right. act. How of, many loans have we done now? We've done four. We've done three. 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 Okay. Tell us number four. Uh, the next one is a family. So there's a husband and wife and a daughter. I mm-hmm. did loans for the husband and wife, and I did loans for the daughter, predominantly around uh, that they have an investment portfolio as a family. Some of the properties are in the daughter's name, some of the properties are in the mum and dad's name. Mm. Um, they do predominantly holiday letting with their investment properties. They're through um, uh, Gippsland and along uh, Port Phillip Bay, and um, they have, uh, I think, four investment properties at the peak before they sold, because they brought and sold a few during the time of loans. Um, um, and they did holiday letting on them. On one of my applications that I submitted, uh, there was a property that was new to the holiday letting. There was no evidence of, of, of prior holiday letting apart from maybe a little bit of spasmatic information. There was no evidence of um, uh, any other form of rental income on the property. So when I submitted the application, um, I got a rental letter. Uh, it's generally one of the requirements that we can do to sort of verify what sort of income a property could earn. For, uh, the client supplied a rental letter from a real estate agent, giving their assessment on what they think the property would earn in rent if it was long-term rented out. Right. submitted the application with that letter from the start of the application. Uh, during the process of the approval, I had a chat to the credit manager and discussed uh, that, you know, we've got a rental letter. This is all we can really kind of get at the moment because they're looking at doing holiday let. Obviously, if holiday let fails and they don't make any money on the investment property, they will turn into a full-time investment property, but they want to try holiday let. Uh, the credit manager was happy to rest on the rental letter as income. There was other income, the other investment properties all had, you know, all had tenants and whatever and whatever, so they were yep. all fine. It was this particular property that we didn't have really much information on, and that's what we used for for yep, evidence yep. of servicing. Um, the clients came back to me 10 months later, uh, approximately nine, 10 months later, and requested a top-up for that particular loan. We obviously had nine, 10 months of holiday let, property had done exceptionally well. It had done far above the proposed long-term rental letter that we supplied on the original application. So this was Airbnb? Airbnb, uh, stays, uh, online, um, short-term stays. They would earn more on a weekend than what they would earn on the property generally in a month. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was when I submitted the second application, I had rental data. I had the information from stays. I submitted the application with that data. There was evidence that that data was far above what the property was earning. However, I still serviced it on the lower rental letter amount. I turned around and said on the top-up application, even though it's earning $900 a week on average, the rental letter said it could earn around about $700 a week. We went on $700 a week. So I kept on the lower of the two to make sure we had a buffer there. Um, Upon my review, um, cut a long story short because we're going backwards and forwards a little bit with myself and the the reviewer on the file, but they basically said that I was misleading because I submitted the uh, the first application with uh, a rental letter on a property that was going to be used for short-term rent. And you, and they're saying that you somehow had a crystal ball and you knew that it was going to be um, uh, well, I did, that, I did, that way? Well, I did know that it was going to be short-term let. It was part of the application. Um, one of my... But doesn't it follow that if short-term letting... Oh, so you did know and you put in there that it was going to be short-term let? Uh, no, we used the rental letter for servicing because we had no evidence. Right. We had no evidence. To, it was a new investment property. There right, was, right. Doesn't it follow, though, that if an owner has a property, it's in their interest to get the highest possible return for it. Correct. Well, it's also... And so if the lowest return is long-term rental yeah. and they're planning on doing short-term rental yeah. 
and let's say short-term rental didn't work out for them, they would switch to long-term rental. Correct, that would have been their plan. And there's no promise if the place is unlet at this moment when they do the loan that it's going to be let within a certain period or anything else like that. Correct. So this sounds like something that a bureaucrat would pick up on as a sort of a technical thing rather than something that would affect the serviceability of the loan. Correct, yeah. And we always serviced off the lower of the two. Right, okay. Okay, so I've, I've got to hear more. I want to hear the bit where um, um, uh, so something, something substantive that would warrant you being expelled or um, me being removed from the role of solicitor. So, so the, let's get on to that. The, uh, so basically they said to me that they did extensive research and one of the investment properties, there was no evidence whatsoever that the property was ever leased out and right. that I just said that it was an investment property to increase her servicing. Um, uh, the allegation being that it was, it was being purchased for her to live in. Correct, yes, correct. They were saying that, right. that, that the allegation was for her to live in. Um, uh, after the, my review, I uh, uh, rang my wife and while I was talking on the phone driving home from the review, she Googled the property. Yep. She could see that the property had long-term holiday let. I then rang the client and verified and they sent me proof that the property was rented almost weeks after the property settled from the purchase. Right. As okay. a, again, as a holiday let, um, but the property had, had Good. been Let's used. Let's move on. I'm a judge. If I was a judge, yeah. nothing you've said warrants you being struck off at the moment. If I was another broker, nothing you've said warrants you being struck off. I'm on the edge of my seat for number five. This is the one that they said is fraudulent, that, 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 that Equifax gave a red light to. No, that was Michael's one, one with the with the work for his mum. <laughs> oh, that was work yeah. for his mum was yeah. fraud. Yeah, so so that's that's all the applications. There was the original. So that, the, wait a minute. Yeah, so they that, said that, that, that was fraud, even though. Well, even though they, they never they, they never said fraud to me in the review. My BDM told me prior to the review that this they got this red light right, system. Right, right. One okay. file well, was what's fraudulent. The next, that's, that's, the one. that's that's the files. So we've done five files. I think that's all of them. Yeah. Because the, 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 the husband and wife had the original in the top up. All right, Joshua. Thank you very much um, for going through those files. Uh, what the brokers might be saying uh, when they watch this, or what Blasser might be saying, or anyone else might be saying, is we've heard your side of the story. That sounds innocent enough. But what's their side of the story? Their side of the story is that you forged someone's signature or that you... Uh, had pay slips that you were making. The problem is, for me, as your lawyer, is no accusations have been made against you in writing. Uh, no. There is no due process whatsoever. They haven't uh, complained to ASIC. And Not that I'm aware of, no. And, yeah. and therefore, there's been the, the license, the license uh, regulator hasn't actually reviewed this case or done anything. No. Now, um, I've got a copy here of a letter of the cancellation of your uh, loan writer accreditation. I refer to your arrangements uh, to introduce loan applications on the Plan Australia broker platform. Um, Plan has been notified that NAB and Plan have withdrawn, Plan Lend. Yep, as a lender. Right, have withdrawn your accreditation to submit loan applications to NAB and Plan Lend. Consequently, Plan is terminating your accreditation to introduce applications on the Plan Australia broker platform. They've cancelled your codes, and please ensure you do not engage in further credit activities. Okay, any questions, ring Steve Bourne. All right, so you did have some questions for Steve Bourne. I did. And I've now uh, got an email which we'll put up on the screen, uh, which shows what Steve Bourne says to you. I've reviewed the files. I would like to clarify that the termination was processed by Plan Lend and NAB Broker. As a result of any lender termination, Plan reviews the file and makes a decision to continue or not with the aggregation agreement. Now that flies in the face of what I saw in another letter that Plan sent, where they said, if you get uh, disavowed by a lender, as far as we're concerned, it's all over. Anyone who wants to have a look at that, have a look at broker alert number one. It says, in this instance, the information provided by the lender led us to concerns with the level of due diligence completed in lending applications. 
the full disclosure of client information and the accurate nature of the documentation provided. Based on this review, the decision to determinate the plan has been confirmed. Okay, so when they say they're concerned with the level of due diligence, the question is, what is the level of due diligence? I'm not aware. Applicable. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just saying to the world yeah. at large, yeah. what is the level of due diligence applicable? Because uh, they're concerned that you didn't uh, compare pay slips to uh, bank statements at a time when that wasn't required, for example. Yeah. Uh, so that would be considered grossly unfair were this to go before any tribunal or, or court. Um, uh, ASIC, for example, wouldn't bother trying to pull that on you because you would appeal straight to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and, and that would be the end of it. He says, I would like to clarify the reason why we are unable to provide a clear letter of release. Plan Lend termination stands and has not been overturned. Based on this lender decision, we are unable to issue anything other than an adverse letter of separation. This is the case for any lender terminations we receive and exit letters we issue. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because that kind of contradicts what he said in the first paragraph. In the first paragraph, he seems to be suggesting that there's an independent review of the files once a lender terminates you. Now he's saying that if a lender terminates you, we don't give you a clean letter, okay? Uh, I appreciate you may not agree with the determination. However, following the lender termination, the BLASA review, and now this further review, the decision to terminate remains. Okay, well, you don't appreciate it because you're actually evicted from the industry. Correct. At this point in time, with that exit letter, I without can... Without that exit letter. Uh, without a clean separation without letter. Without a clean separation letter. And with the exit letter you did get, and which wasn't clean. Correct. I cannot rejoin an aggregator or re-get accredited with any lender, regardless of, of my position or my argument. So it's like a Hollywood blacklist. You're not allowed to work in this town. I mean, it's not this town, it's this entire country. It's the entire country and the entire industry. So really, when you think about it, if that's right, uh, it's a racket. It's a collusive arrangement between all the aggregators to keep you out of the industry, uh, to blacklist you. Yeah. Uh, and they are effectively, in that regard, acting as a cartel. Tune in next time. I'm Matthew Bransgrove. And I'm Joshua D. Batista. Thanks for your time. Thank you.